Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Newstar. This is the Friday show that reviews the most surprising media news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson, in today's show. What's next for Google Search? It's going to be so challenging for Google. They need to position themselves more as like an end-to-end provider of, of products and services. So it's not just the discovery aspect, right? But again, this is comparing to Amazon. What would it take for advertisers to leave Facebook. Who wants to touch Facebook as an agency, but Facebook is using this opportunity to figure out who can best deal with all of their issues to find the right clients to then advertise on Facebook. Regulating algorithms. A lot of these cases that we've seen is that these algorithms are sort of like a Frankenstein's monster where even the companies themselves don't know the extent of the negative effects. Restaurant robots, how to run better meetings, and how fantasy football came into existence. All right, folks, joining me for this episode, we have three people. Let's meet them. We start with one of our principal analysts covering retail. It's Susie David Canyon. Hi, everyone. Hey, Susie. Thanks for hanging out. We're also joined by one of our directors of forecasting. His name is Oscar Orozco. Hey, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Hey, chap. And finally, we have one of our analysts on the retail and e-commerce team. He goes by Blake Drosh. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. Hey, fellas. So there are the three folks we have for you. But what are we talking about today? Well, we start with the story of the week, talking about what's next for Google search. We move to the game of the week, our second segment, where our contestants, Susie Blake and Oscar, will go to head to head to head, give us the best takeaway they possibly can from each of the four stories we have for you. We move to working from somewhere. We're going to be talking about how to run better meetings. And finally, we end with dinner party day. So you know what happens in that segment. Maybe you don't. You'll see. Anyway, we start with the story of the week. What's next for Google search? The story, uh, this story happened a week or so ago, but because of all the recent Facebook hoopla, we had to cover that and push this back a little. So what happens? Well, at the end of September, Data Bon, The Verge, wrote that at Google's recent search on event, they introduced several new features that, taken together, are its strongest attempts yet to get people to do more than type a few words into a search box. They're trying to use machine learning to provide more detail and context-rich answers or a more advanced version of machine learning. Google, in turn, hopes that users will ask more detailed and context-rich questions if it is serving those types of answers up. The end result, a richer and deeper search experience. So basically, yeah, Google said, hey, we're doing all these new things with search. We'll talk a bit about them in a second. But I'd like to start with what you guys think is next for search. Is it adding context, as Google said it's going to be focusing on? Is it answering more complicated questions? Is it follow-up questions? Is it voice? Is it voice search? What do you guys think? So I think if you're taking it from the retailer perspective, which is always my lens around shopping, for this particular idea, it's around image searches and specifically the context around that, right? So the idea around, is there inventory at the local store that's providing that? Is there other items that match with this? If you like this picture, you'll also like this picture and subsequently the item that the picture is showcasing. So I really think that's the right way to go. Yeah. And they said they're going to be, Google said, shopping results will begin to show inventory available in nearby stores and even clothing in different styles associated with that search. So something they're working on, also working on more images, more image heavy results, less text links. Gents, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, for me, clearly for retail and shopping, that's the most obvious use case and and where uh, what they have in mind moving forward. But I I was thinking more from the searcher's perspective as well. And um, I thought of things like what we do with Shazam, which is kind of the audio uh, voice searching, right? So finding songs with the audio. uh, I've even used like that, which is for um, searching for fashion items with pictures. So I'm taking it a step further you know, thinking five, 10 years from now, but other sensories, you know, so this is getting a little bit wacky here, but are we going to see things like uh, searching by smell, by taste, things like touch? I mean, you know, I I just see so much potential there. So this was very exciting to me and it makes total sense for Google to look into this. Did you guys ever watch Richie Rich? Yes. That film, there was the smell master. 
Do you remember that device that was cooked up by Professor Keen Bean? It was the Smell Master. <laughs> it was like a machine. It was like a little kind of toy gun that you, or gun shaped device that you aimed at uh, whatever you wanted and you pressed and it would tell you it what the thing was based, really on, based on the smell. Yeah, yeah. really familiar. Great well, film. I guess I, I great remember film. that movie sort of what I was what I was imagining. Did you take that from that movie, Oscar? <laughs> no, I did not. No, I okay. did not. Great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, Oscar, I think you're right. I don't know about the smell, but I think you're right about the next level. But I also think it'll depend on the channel. So it'll be different if you're using Google Home, if you're using your laptop, if you're using your phone, mm, the TV, the car. Like I think context is much more than just the images that come back to you or the text that comes back to you. It's also where you're using it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. Something else they're focusing on, things to know boxes that send you off to different subtopics, uh, something else that Google is working on. Uh, but they are trying to get beyond the text box, as they note. So they recognize that there are stages to this. They're not just going to kind of leap off into the future where you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the computer and it knows everything that you're, that you're talking about. They say that new ways to go beyond text uh, is image recognition software, Google Lens, uh, now not just identifying flowers, but also being able to ask questions and shop as well through Google Lens. So in one example, Google says that you'll be able to take a picture of a flowery pattern on a shirt and ask Google for socks with a similar pattern. Uh, it could even help you, Google Lens could help you identify pieces of your bike that are broken that you don't even know the name of. So other search use cases there. Um, in terms of visual search, there's a lot of interest in it actually. Retail, in visual search shopping technology at least, 50% of folks were interested according to Insider Intelligence Biz Rate Insights Survey. 27%, so half as many, were not interested. 15% had used it. If you ask the young people, 18 to 34, 24% of young people had used visual search retail shopping technology. One of the problems, folks, with, with voice search, which it, it seems like companies want it to happen at some point, all of a sudden you're giving a lot of power to the device. Now you're thinking about it as, you know, not just you looking on Google for something, but Google's giving you its point of view or with, you know, an Amazon Alexa device or whatever. This is known as the one true answer problem. Do you guys see that being a problem in, in the future and any ways to kind of get around that idea that you speak to something, search, you speak to a device and you're looking for something and uh, you just kind of have to trust that the result it gives you is the one that's best for you and not the one that's been paid for by the relevant advertiser? Yeah, I think that can serve a purpose for you know, if you're asking what the weather is going to be tomorrow, but for more advanced search, I don't think, I think that there's a, a threshold where that type of technology is going to be useful with actual research. If somebody is doing something, you know, that's a little bit more complex than just looking for a one word answer, I think that's where Google and other search engines have room to improve in terms of aggregating a field of more accurate search results. But then we're looking at a different use case for some of the more emerging versions of search that we're seeing with technology like visual search and voice search and things like that. So it's yeah. kind of it's kind of two different purposes. I think that there's sort of room to grow for both of them in terms of optimization. But I would caution against treating search as just sort of one big catch-all because it, the activity of search yes. involves so many different things. It's very complex. Yeah. Every movie as well, every futuristic movie that uses voice to search, whether you know speaking to an AI, it always has a screen as well. There's always a screen element. So the AI will show things up on the screen and then the person has more context and picks the right thing. So I imagine that when we talk about voice, uh, we're going to be moving towards a future that allows for a screen to be incorporated. So you're not just having to blindly imagine what the things are that the, thing that the device is recommending. Um, I'd like to finish the story of the week by talking about Google's search influence and whether we think that's waning. A couple of stats here to suggest maybe it is. Cohen and company show that when looking for clothing, Americans most likely to visit Amazon. Google wasn't even in second place, it was in third. Channel Advisor found 53% of Americans start their product search on Amazon, way behind the 23% that use search engines first, like Google. 
That was from last year. Both those stats were from last year. Actually, search engines, share of people who use search engines was only a few points ahead of people who go straight to the brand or retailer sites when they're starting their product search. And finally, for research on holiday gifts, it was Amazon again beating Google 65 to 45 in terms of the share of US adults who do that, a 20 point gap. In terms of where people buy things, it was a 47 point gap in Amazon's favor over Google. So do we think Google's got a bit of a, a search issue when it comes to Amazon stealing share? Yeah, I think definitely they're going to, Amazon's going to continue to steal share from the duopoly in general, but certainly in the search field, because you are that much closer to the point of sale as an advertiser. However, I will say that Google and Amazon in a lot of different categories of e-commerce are faced with the same issue that it's not really a shopping mall experience. It's not fun. And that's where social media still has the upper hand Mm -hmm. when it comes to shopping and if so Mm -hmm. facto advertising. Whereas with you know, certain more essential and regular products. Yeah, sure. Surge is still going to be strong on those platforms like that. But I think that I wouldn't put uh, Amazon too far ahead into a different league than Google because they both do sort of offer the same type of behavior when it comes to search. Yeah, I think I think Google has a lot of catching up to do on the e-commerce side. We've actually sized this ad channel on the forecasting team. Uh, it's e-commerce channel ad spending. We uh, believe that it takes up about 13% of all digital ad spending. And Google wow. is not playing in this at all, right? So this is just looking at you know the Amazons, the Walmarts, and the Etsys. So it is clearly a new potential revenue stream for Google, and they have a lot of catch-up to play. But I think for the shopper, it's going to be so challenging for Google. They need to position themselves more as like an end-to-end provider. Of, of products and services. So it's not just the discovery aspect, right? But again, this is comparing to Amazon, but it would be, can, you know, the delivery is going to be as fast and timely. The checkout process, is it as quick fulfillment too on the back end? So there's so yeah. much more to it than just the discoverability aspect. And- also, do you believe that Google has everything there? That's, for me, one a lot of the reason that uh, I'll go to Amazon and I hear anecdotally that other people go to Amazon is because you trust that when you look there, everything is there. So you don't have to go to multiple places. With Google and shopping, to me, it doesn't feel like everything's there and in a very concise manner for me to look through things. With Google Flights, if I go trying to look for a flight, I trust that Google is able to scan the internet and figure out which are the best flights. But for some reason, it just doesn't come across that way when it comes to shopping. I don't know. I'm cautious optimistic about Google as a search platform for enabling shopping, especially Mm. when you think about the new people that they've brought in and they have two teams that are worried about the merchants separate from the consumer to make sure that the interface for the consumer is easy to use, like the Google Lens and the images and just thinking about retail and efficiencies and ease and convenience, but also working with Shopify and other platforms to enable that end-to-end shopping. Because technically, Google is really just a search engine optimization space, right? It's not a seller. It's just trying to enable and connect people to one another. And in this case, it's the merchants with the consumers. So I think they're going to do well. I'm a little bit less optimistic. I mean, I see the potential and, and they definitely have the the money to make this happen. But but again, going back to the shopper experience, even just thinking about an app and having this comfortable you know shopping app to navigate for the consumer, I mean, I, I, that feels very far away for me. And just, you know, it's ironically having less ads overall, which we don't deal with as much on Amazon. So there's a lot that needs to be uh, fixed, I think, yeah. for the potential to grow into reality. If yeah, if you're looking for something to buy, typically going to Amazon. If you're looking just to search for stuff, Google is still the place for that. Uh, looking at Google's US search ad revenues as a percentage of all the money spent on search advertising, 61% of the market in 2019, today 57. So down 4 points in 2 years time, it will be 53. So down another 4 points. So Google's share this is share, not total dollars. Share of the US search ad spending market is falling, but they still have over 53% or will do by 2023. 
In other good news, Google is also adding a feature where shoppers searching for a product are able to filter by in stock. We were literally just talking about this on Wednesday's holiday shopping episode with Andrew. So thank you, Google, for listening to that uh, episode and figuring that out. Um, all right, that's all we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Newstar. Are you prepared for marketing's next chapter? You won't want to miss Brave New Worlds 2021, the virtual marketing analytics event of the year on November 9th and 10th. You can join Brave New Worlds to learn how you can adapt to the forces redefining advertising. It's free and you'll hear from today's top minds in marketing, data and analytics, including executives from Facebook, General Motors, Capgemini, Publicis and more. Go to bravenewworlds.newstar to register today. All right, folks, we are back. Time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what is the point? The part of the show where we read out four stories. Now our contestants, Susie, Blake, and Oscar, tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story. Okay, answers get one point. Good answers get two. And Derek Henry rushing stats level answers. They'll get you three points. It was big for me this week. Yes, I am 6-0 and in my fantasy football league, in case you were wondering. <laughs> However... That reference, thank you, sir. That reference probably means nothing to our non-football audience. So, Game of Thrones, that feeling that you got when you watched the prequel trailer recently, those level answers, they'll get you three points. Everyone's back. Each person gets 20 seconds before they hear this. Whoever has the most points after four rounds wins, gets the last word. So, we'll start with Blake. What would it take for advertisers to leave Facebook? Asks eMarketer Briefing Director Jeremy Goldman. Performance marketers like mobile app advertisers that are using Facebook predominantly to drive app installs and who face aggressive revenue targets, they aren't boycotting Facebook anytime soon, Jeremy notes. However, boycotts from big institutional brands like P&G and Nike or Nike are or could be another story. Blake, what would it take for advertisers to leave Facebook? What's the point? The users leaving Facebook is the only thing that would make advertisers leave Facebook. Back clean. <laughs> Whoa. What where the hell did Blake go? Who's this? Who's this who's this guy? That was like four seconds. That's right. <laughs> he came to play. Oscar. For me is not even users leaving. It's not gonna happen. You know, we keep talking about all of these scandals. I've lost track of them. But to me, Facebook's untapped in many ways. Uh, we still haven't seen much monetization on WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. So in many ways, it's untouched. And so I think this is totally not, it's overblown. It's not happening. Let's move on. Susie. I hope there's not monetization on WhatsApp because that's going to make me very sad to have to go through ads before I can talk to my parents. Um, as far as... As far as what does this mean, I'm going to talk about something completely different, which is apparently Facebook is looking oh. for their next agency, right? And according to one of the articles, and I thought that was fascinating, right? It's like, who wants to touch Facebook as an agency, but Facebook is using this opportunity to figure out who can best deal with all of their issues to find the right clients to then advertise on Facebook. And that Maybe the halo effect will not be a true thing, but Facebook must believe it could be. And so they're worried. Deborah Aho Williamson, she goes by Debbie, our principal analyst covering social, says, quote, if ad performance were to start suffering, advertisers would look to other media. But brand safety concerns alone aren't going to drive most advertisers away, close quote. Move to our second story. We start with Oscar regulating algorithms. What happened be- to the points? I'm keeping them. Oh, <laughs> Oh, you want a tally? Yes. <laughs> oh, we've never done a tally. No, we no, tally oh, we years. used to before this this whole thing I, got corrupt. Why oh, are we having, it's not we have this corrupt. conversation every time? You're All supposed right, to points. give us points. Okay, uh, this is a lot to have to do as well as host the yeah. show, but I can, let me pull up the it's thing. part of hosting the show. Okay. <laughs> part of the thing. Gosh, guys, let's... I leave Marcus alone. Oh, Thank you. Oscar's this is oh, extra points for Oscar. Oscar, Oscar. Oscar. Okay. ten points for you know Oscar. No, I, I was always going to give him ten. Points. No, I was going to always give him ten. Uh, Susie for making me do this. One point. Oscar ten. Blake five. Susie one. It's a shame. Uh, regulating algorithms. We start with Oscar. The algorithms versus regulators battle royale kicks off in China and could have implications for Western markets. Writes Jackie Wong of the Wall Street Journal. 
China has a three-year plan to regulate the use of algorithms, and according to draft rules just released, companies can't use algorithms which lead to addiction or excessive spending, and users should also have the right to opt out. They do also say algorithms should uphold core socialist values and promote positive energy. Uh, The US government has put forward the Justice Against Malicious Algorithms Act, sponsored by House Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman Frank Pallone. The new bill takes aim at websites' liability shield and would remove protections if recommended content leads to real-world harm. Oscar, regulating algorithms, what's the point? You don't have to answer this. You've already won the game. (laughs) You can if you want. Let's, let's answer that. <laughs> That's why I'm on. Now, uh, in terms of algorithms, <laughs> it reminds me of the conversation we actually had a few days ago and the, as it relates to targeted ads and that paradox of people wanting more targeted ads, but then, you know, sometimes feeling very invasive. I think of it's the same sort of analogy with algorithms. Users want recommended content that they're interested in watching. And on the other hand, it could seem invasive. But, you know, I think we have to go that route, which is targeted. And so algorithms to me are a plus. Sure, Facebook should regulate it a little bit uh, and all these publishers. But overall, I think consumers want algorithms. They want content that they're interested in. Susie. So I'm concerned that we're looking to China, who I don't know if you guys heard on the news, is passing a potential bill around punishing guardians if their kids exhibit bad behavior. So now we're going to take a step from what China is doing around social media platforms and algorithms to make a decision here. Makes me nervous, but mostly because who's deciding it sort of at the beginning and the end of the conversation? Who's deciding what is good and bad and how do we decide what is right to be part of the algorithm and what is giving the right content? Blake. Yeah, I think that, you know, really everything that's harmful to society involving social networks generally has to do with sort of the power of the algorithms. And I think certainly regulating them would help and should happen. But I think a lot of these cases that we've seen is that these algorithms are sort of like a Frankenstein's monster where even the companies themselves don't know the extent of the negative effects. So I think regulating would, I think, force a lot of transparency, but it wouldn't solve the entire issue with algorithms alone. In April, the EU proposed a bill to regulate AI systems in some so-called high-risk uses like critical infrastructure, college admissions, and loan applications. So it seems like governments across the world are trying to wrangle with uh, AI and algorithms and how best to regulate them. We move to our third story. Oscar's got 12 points. Blake's got eight. Susie does not have eight. Did Oscar lose six points on... No, he started, he was had 10 in the first I'm round. I'm winning, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we start with Susie for our third round. How can advertisers get into gaming? Advertisers are aware of video gaming as a media channel, but unsure how to unlock it, notes Exchange Wire. And why wouldn't they want in? Three billion active gamers will spend around $176 billion on games this year, according to Samuel Huber, CEO and co-founder of in-play ad platform Admix. The desktop web was the dominant media channel for the 2000s, then social media in the 2010s. Video gaming is now on the cusp of claiming the crown of key media channel, I guess he means for the next decade. Susie, how can advertisers get into gaming? What's the point? So I think the most important part for me as someone who uses free gaming apps is that this is a great place to captivate someone who's not willing to pay for the game to service them a real ad. Like if it is not personalized, you are wasting everybody's time. And now I hate the brand that's giving me something that has nothing to do with what's going on in my life. But I don't think it'll work as a channel if I'm paying for the game. Blake. Yeah, I think that, you know, video games in general is it, that's sort of an area that advertisers have been talking about getting into for a while because it is and it can be a way to reach a specific type of audience. And I think it should remain that way. I think that advertisers should be approaching video games to reach certain niche audiences, often younger, often different types of, you know, subcultures that are associated with different video games. But I don't see, even in the near future, it becoming a platform that can really generate a ton of general 
reach. And I think that staying within the niche is really the the way to proceed here. Oscar. Yeah, I think the level of sophistication really is, is the problem with the infrastructure. It's not there yet. And, and I agree with Blake, but even from the gaming platform's perspective, I mean, they're monetizing in three ways, one of which is advertising, but it's also subscriptions and in-app or in-game purchases. And so in some ways they need to focus on, on the subscriptions and the purchases first and foremost, because I think they know that advertisers are likely to prioritize other platforms first over gaming. So it's gonna grow, but you know it's not as important to them or advertisers. And I don't think that'll change much. Why get into gaming in the first place? Well, 53% of Americans are digital gamers. There's over half desktop, mobile, app and browser gaming, online console gaming and gaming on social networks. 53% of Americans and uh, 47%, just under half of Americans, are smartphone gamers. If you look at people who are smartphone owners, someone owns a smartphone, it's two thirds of those folks are gamers. So two thirds of smartphone owners are gamers gamers, smartphone gamers. Uh, 70% of regular console gamers play titles with branded in-game content. That's up from 2019. Among those exposed to in-game ads, nearly half prefer in-game ads to to regular ones. And 72% said branded downloadable content actually makes the game more fun to play. That's from Hub Entertainment Research. The numbers on digital gamers were from us. We move to our final round. Uh, We start with Blake Restaurant Robots. Desperate for workers, restaurants turn to robots, writes Janet Morrissey of the New York Times. One Florida restaurant tried to reopen after indoor dining restrictions were eased. Of its 40 staff, 4-0, only four showed up. So the owner turned to table waiting robot Servi that uses cameras and laser sensors to carry plates of food from the kitchen to the tables where the waiter then transfers the plates to the customer's table. Yeah, this robot kind of looks like a small circular shaped shopping trolley with three levels, two for food or three for food, uh, and then one for dishes. It can be adapted to, to food or dishes. The robot costs a thousand dollars a month, including installation and support. Restaurant robots, Blake, what's the point? It's something that can basically go to a point where there's a certain use case, I think, for any type of robot technology in any business, but I don't think it's ever going to replace a waiter. I mean, you're still going to have a waiter in a restaurant because the whole point of like going out to eat is like getting that sort of human service. I mean, why else are you going out and, you know, spending your money at a sit down restaurant? So I could see restaurants that sort of cut corners and in favor of these robots could ultimately be cheapening their brand. I mean, I think it's a novelty for a lot of people, but things like fine dining and other sort of more upscale restaurants and experiences are always going to rely on a human touch. Oscar. Yeah, looking past the novelty aspect, which Blake just talked about. I mean, to me, this story, it was a serious story for me. There there was a data point, an organization reporting that 76% of current and former restaurant workers are leaving the industry because they're not making enough money. You know, we struggle so much to pass any meaningful minimum wage increases across the country. To me, it was more about that. I wonder what the fierce opponents to minimum wage increases are saying now, because this is pandemic induced, but it is clearly a, a systemic issue through the service industry. So that, that's what this story was more about. Robots aren't going to solve anything. Let's focus on the servers and getting them uh, more money. Susie. I don't know how to follow that (laughs) because I want to talk about the robots. I loved the story personally in terms of the robot technology. And I think we're not ready necessarily to have robots everywhere. Just like in warehouses when they're packing and picking, there are people still doing some tasks. But what I find here is that it's interesting that today consumer is more ready to adopt the technology. Whereas there were a few years ago, I don't know if you guys remember in New York, there was a sushi belt restaurant, which was like a novelty and it was very cool and it didn't need people. The chef just dropped the sushi and it went around and you took whatever you wanted, but it didn't survive. I think we just weren't ready for that. We wanted the personal touch that Blake is talking about, or there's this restaurant that was not far from my house, Itza. I don't know if you guys know that one where it was like you go on an iPad, you order what you want, some robot is making it in the back, it makes it into a locker, you go open it, you take it, also didn't make it. But I think with everything that happened in the last 18 months, these type of novel technologies might actually survive. 
Uh, a few points from me. One, I hate the lost human interaction. However, it ain't always what you hope it would be. And I think we often romanticize kind of about the the experience and like how great it would be to have a human touch. Sometimes the human touch is miserable and the server is not happy at all. Um, <laughs> second point, using the robot, it does, uh, well, according to the article, let overworked servers spend a bit more time with customers, which led to higher tips for those workers. And then finally, They don't have to replace the jobs, in my opinion. Peanut Robotics, they make a robot that cleans restrooms. SoftBank Robotics makes one that vacuums floors. My parents' robot vacuum cleaner that I bought them, Mrs. Doubtfire is what they called it. They bought another one. They called it Arthur. Uh, It cleans the floors for them so they can spend time cleaning other things. They never have to clean the floors anymore and kind of bend over sweeping or, or mopping. They can just go about their day and clean other things and they work kind of in tandem with the robot. So I don't see it as having to replace anybody. Um, Not everyone will have that opinion though, I'm sure. Um, That's what we've got time for for the game of the week. This week's winner. Don't worry, don't bother about the drum roll Oscar one. (laughs) 14 points to Oscar, 10 to Blake, 8 for Susie. You came back at the end there, Susie. You know what, I I bet a ton of money on Oscar winning this game of the week, so I think I'm I'm the real winner here because I just, (laughs) the the odds, the odds were incredible. They were too good to pass They were pretty high, yeah. Yeah, I'm honored. You're the best host, Marcus. Thanks, friends. Appreciate it. (laughs) Too kind. You get the last word, my friend. What do you want to say? Last word. Well, as some listeners know, I, I, you know, I tend to use the platform to talk about sports, specifically soccer, or as the world calls it, football, as much as I can. I was reading an article this morning from The Athletic about a new potential TV deal for the Premier League, which is the English Soccer League. It was in 2012, NBC paid $250 million for three years of access to games. That comes out to about $80 million. They're talking about the new deal potentially being a nine-year, $3 billion deal. $3 billion. Wow. ESPN just paid $165 million a year for La Liga, which is the Spanish league. To put into perspective, the NFL signed a new media rights agreement with pretty much all the networks. That Collectively, it, it comes out to about $10 billion a year. So not quite there, but the growth we're Still. seeing from soccer or football in this country is incredible. Uh, I would add one last thing. The MLS, the local soccer league, the national league here, has the third highest attendance per game just behind the NFL and MLB. So keep an eye on soccer. I'm always saying it. This is real, guys. Very nice. Very nice, sir. Um, All right. So we've got time for for the game of the week. Congratulations to Oscar. Thank you. Uh, It's time now. (laughs) You're very welcome, sir. It's time now for working (laughs) from somewhere. All right, folks, working from somewhere. This is a segment where we talk about what it's like to work from somewhere now that the world of uh, hybrid work um, is upon us. So today we're talking about an article from The Economist on how to run better meetings. So yeah, how to run better meetings. The jury system offers clues to managers everywhere, writes The Economist. Before the pandemic, managers were spending an average of 23 hours a week in meetings if you're working a 40-hour week, which no one does, everyone works more, but that would be 58% of their time in meetings for managers. Uh, And it has since gotten even more out of control. The article notes that there are many suggestions on how to make meetings better, start with some fun, or get people to stand up so they are more focused. But there is a form of meeting that reliably results in good decisions and that commands general respect, even reverence. That meeting is the jury people who decide the fate of people in court. At the Bartleby column points to five lessons that the jury has to offer meetings people. So what are they? Number one, set the stage. Why are you here? Why are we here? Answer that question. And what are we trying to achieve in the meeting? Number two, is the size right? Uh, The 12 person formula for the jury dates back to 12th century England and the reign of Henry II. Not too many people that it's disruptive, but not too few people where you lose the diversity of opinion. Number three, have an agenda and make decisions. There is no let's bookmark this for later with a jury. You have to make a decision. Number four, jurors are less prone to group think speak your mind. Anyone can lead. It doesn't have to be the most senior person in the meeting. And number five, psychological safety, i.e. the willingness of people to speak up and constructively critique ideas. Uh, So the why, do you have enough people in the meeting, the right size of meeting? Do you have an agenda? Not falling prey to groupthink and then uh, speaking up and being constructive with your criticism. Thoughts, folks? 
Do you think this is for uh, Zoom meetings or do you think it's for any meeting? Because I feel like it's hard doing some of those things when you're all on video. I agree with them, but it's just so hard to execute. Yeah, it's a good question. The article was written like a few weeks ago or recently. So, I mean, you would have had to definitely take into consideration the state of the world currently. But yeah, it's a good point. Um, They didn't distinguish between, you know, what does work in person, this doesn't. Any other thoughts? I think don't make them 30 minutes just because it's the default time. And don't make them have to run 30 minutes if you do set 30 minutes. They can end early. Absolutely. I mean, I think for me, it's about shortening the length of meetings. And and definitely, if you you don't need the full time, you know, cut people some slack. Uh, I think the one thing I thought of is as the presenter, preparing for a meeting and coming through and and making sure it's engaging and interesting is it takes work and a lot of energy. So I think we need to put the Mm. onus more on the attendees in some ways too, to prepare for them to, you know, jot notes down during it. So maybe there's less, um, cutting into the presenter's time and leaving some time at the end for asking questions or making comments. Uh, I think that's more important than uh, maybe than adding more activities or, or doing things that that's, the article was kind of suggesting as, as examples to make them more fun. So yeah. maybe less fun, but, you know, just more t- to the point and more organized. Well, Oscar, I thought about our forecast. So I used to be on the forecasting team yeah. way back when. And I thought about those meetings because when we would review a forecast, everyone has the same share of voice and everyone's opinions are heard and you know the reason that you're there and you go through different points. And the purpose of the meeting is to challenge those ideas uh, and you come out, you know, better for it. And the forecast ends up being better for it because, uh, you know, it really does get put under the microscope. So yeah, I liked that idea of how meetings should be run. You know, the purpose sometimes is just to discuss things. Sometimes it's to criticize things. Sometimes it's to make steps for later and and not to figure out things then. So not every meeting is created equal and you should know what you're trying to achieve in that meeting. Yeah. And it should be clear from the get-go, but but agree that that's what makes it harder. But I do think, you know, whoever's attending, it's it's on them as well to to really to add some input and and everyone needs to be very aware and conscious about the time, right? And not try to go over it. Well, I will tell you that I have a, I had, I don't know if I still do, but a really big pet peeve around people asking for an hour of my time and then only taking 30 minutes because I was like, well, I could organize my day differently. So I, I don't mm. know what that sweet spot of letting me leave early, early so that I have extra time to myself is versus, oh my God, you did not know how to use your time properly and you didn't make the right ask is. Yeah. I would counter that, that a meeting should never be more than an hour. So I highly doubt any would be just 30 if it was meant to be an hour. But so a t- let's say it's it's 10 minutes early, then I don't think that's that big of a deal. But I do hear what you're saying. I, I think that that has happened in the past. Well, the piece does note that juries aren't perfect. Unanimity is no way to run an enterprise and deciding the fate of a fellow citizen uh, can often be more engaging than the average business call. But the, some of those lessons, I think, do still stand. I feel like if we sentence someone to life in prison at the end of every meeting, whoever just performed the worst, <laughs> then that would be a really good way to raise the stakes. <laughs> oh, gosh, Susie, in this context, you would be, based on how the game went, you I would, would unfortunately be heading to prison. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> They'd like send me idea. back to Canada. That's harsh. Marcus. No, we need her. We need her here. Uh, all right, that's what we've got time for for working from somewhere. It's time now for dinner party data. This is the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing that we've recently learned. We start with Oscar because he won the game of the week. Oh, I love dinner party data. All right, let's let's talk about. Who doesn't? Let's, I know, right? Who doesn't? Let's talk about flags. You oh guys, God, no! Have we talked about flags. Before? No, no, we've not talked about flags for oh. a very good reason. It's not interesting. It's boring. Yeah, that's what you. I knew you would say that. I knew you'd say. I All right, to add wow us, Oscar. A bit of wow us. I think you're going to start your next game down ten. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I hope if, I'm on that episode. If, Mar- if Marcus remembers. There's a chance. I'll, I'll, I'll remind I'll, him. Don't you worry. Yeah. I'll sweeten him up a bit before then. Don't worry. Uh-huh. Um, let's talk about flags. Slide flags. Into flags. flags. Yeah. <laughs> I need his number. You know, I'm not that special yet. 
<laughs> flags are fun, Go ahead, guys. Oscar. People, people don't. You guys probably don't know, but they've fascinated me since I was a young boy. Uh, I'm not exaggerating here. I used to flip through like Britannica encyclopedias and read about countries. I know it sounds kind of nerdy, but true. So I wanted to share a few facts about flags with you guys here today. Okay. Um, so let's start a few here. The study of flags is called vexillology. So with three L's there, vexillology. Anybody know that? Mm-hmm. No, of course. Yeah, of course not. Um, <laughs> next one. <laughs> the, Shocking. If anyone can guess how many flags, and we know there's over about 200 countries in the world, but how many flags differ on the front and reverse sides? Could you tell me maybe how many countries have flags that look like this? Just guess. Seven. Good guess. Anyone else? 32. Too many. Less than seven. <laughs> Perfect, Blake. You win. Uh, it's three. Less it's three. than seven. Like, what kind of a cop out? <laughs> three. Less well, than seven. Have you ever up. seen The Price is Right? That's how you cover so you have, you cover your ground. Clearly was a lot of that, Blake. But yes, you won. You won here. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> American <laughs> Points show. for Blake. Three. It's Moldova, Paraguay, Saudi Arabia. A few more. A few huh. more. There is only one non-rectangular national flag. Any any idea which country that is? Oh, I did know this. I is don't know Malta? why I did. Good, good guess. Know. Good guess. Good guess, but not Malta. Oh, I'll just t- tell you guys. It's Nepal. So, it's Nepal. Uh, it's a weird shape. I can't even I can't even describe it. Then there are only two flags that are square. So most are rectangular, as I made clear, but there's only two that are square. That's Switzerland and the Vatican. To finish this off, and of course, USA, USA, we're so special in this country. Did you guys know that by law, the USA burns thousands of flags every year on June 14th? This is called Flag Day. For anyone that doesn't know, it's a holiday. And this is because the flag, when it is in such a condition that it is no longer a fitting emblem for display, should be destroyed in a dignified way, preferably by burning. This is in Section 176K of the U.S. Flag Code. So every year, military veterans burn thousands of flags that don't meet that requirement. So amazing. Isn't that cool? Hmm. The best thing I've ever seen with regards to flag is when you see the military fold them. Have you seen that? that too, like one yeah. of the oh, it's incredible. So with cool. Like, yeah, Always the pinpoint military. precision. It's yeah, it's pretty remarkable the folding of the flag. Um, all right, Not I got bad. into that more than I was expecting to. Yeah. Uh, very good, Oscar, Susie. So I wanted to take a look at Halloween, given that it is just around the corner, and my love for what happens in the UK versus the US. So I wanted to see if the UK celebrates Halloween. So Marcus, you can keep me honest here. And it turns out that it is not quite the same idea in the UK as it is here. However, you do have Cadbury pumpkins and a few other specialty chocolates that just pop up for Halloween. Never heard of them in my life. Because, you know what, you're just falling right into it. Because what you guys (laughs) do celebrate is on November 5th. The yes. guy Fox, I don't know how to say his name. Who His name's, okay, I had this conversation <laughs> with my mate literally two days ago, and she was like, yeah, Guy Fox. And I was like, who is, what are you talking about? It's Guy Fawkes. Oh, gosh. Guy Fox. <laughs> oh, gosh, I got it wrong. <laughs> guy Fox. It sounds the same to me, but okay. But now she's kind of vindicated because she's not the only person who pronounces that. Maybe that's just how all Americans, I've never heard Americans pronounce it before, but it's but not half person, half fox. Nobody's it's a, heard it's of guy him Fox. before. That's why yeah. they don't know how to say it. So because he failed. If he'd succeeded in what he was trying to do, they would have heard of him, but go on. But you would argue because he failed, he should be better known. He, for those of us who didn't know about him until right now, he sort of prevented a gunpowder plot which was to kill one of the kings and it all went down in flames which leads us to bonfires and fireworks and that takes me to the party data which is do we know where fireworks originated china china oh how did you guys know that <laughs> <laughs> that's where gunpowder yeah. was made so that was why i guess but that. it came from bamboo shoots and it was like i didn't very- know that I didn't know it's that. It's very plain oh. until it became real fireworks. Oh. Do we know? I feel like now you're going to know the answer to every question. No wonder I never win. So how many pounds of fireworks were consumed in 2020 in the U.S.? I have no idea, hmm. but I'm very curious to know the answer to that. Yeah. 
405 million. And that wow. is up significantly wow. from 2000, where it was 152 million. And an ode to my old life. Do we know who? That was the hint. So you should all get it. <laughs> do we know who makes, who has the biggest fire show display in the US? Is it Nordstrom? <laughs> I want to be right. Macy's. Macy's. Yay! Yes. That's right. <laughs> but the biggest party data here, I think, was that the UK does not celebrate Halloween and instead they have bonfires and fireworks on November 5th. I love bonfires. That's great. I was going to say, do pandas and bamboo, are they, should we be scared? Pandas look so cute and cuddly, but are they doing anything with the bamboo that could be dangerous? No, I think they had to put it, you have to put the, the way it became fireworks from what I understood from my reading is that because the bamboos are hollow, like the fire would sort of go through. So it wasn't quite uh, as fireworky as we now know fireworks to be. Oh, I understand. Gotcha. Really cool. Susie, you mentioned about Guy Fawkes. He didn't prevent it. He was responsible. Oh, really? Yeah, he was part of the the gunpowder plot. Guys, this was my testing to see if Marcus listens to our... I did listen. Wow. Our game of the party data, and I just want to be sure that he was Game a of true the party Brit. data? That is not a segment. <laughs> game of the party data? Yeah, he's uh, he's the he was the bad one. Well, you know what? A hundred points for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Blake, what you got? Very good, Susie. Very good. I just would like to add that the UK, the Union Jack flag, fantastic flag. The flag of England, Thank you. terrible. Bland. Whoa. What is it? It's like there's the red cross on it. Like it's a classic. It's not a classic. I gotta uh, just give it the Union Jack. That's a St. George's that's cross. A bold flag. I don't care whose cross it is. It's it's under. It's an <laughs> underwhelming flag. Um. So it's easy to draw, and that's all I care about. That's true. <laughs> so everybody's heard the everybody's heard the phrase "time is money," right? So Civic Science recently ran a survey. To ask, in general, would you say you value your time or your money more? And 50% of respondents said that they value their time and their money both the same amount. But for the people that did pick a side, the most popular answer, 26%, said that they value their time by a lot. Uh, and then... Oh. 12% said they value their time over their money, but only by a little bit. And then 7% valued their money over their time a little bit. And then just 5% said that their money was way more valuable than their time, which I think, uh, you know, in this day and age, that's that kind of makes me feel optimistic that we're not all, you know, just slaves to the dollar at this point. And, uh, yeah. and you know, a good chunk of people actually have, uh, you know, a healthy idea of, you know, the value of uh, of their time and that it's not all about making money. I value my time. I'm forced by society to value yeah, yeah, money. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, more money yeah. for the rest of us. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's really interesting. Very good. Yeah. Very good, very good. One quick one for you. Uh, how did fantasy football get started? Well, according to Eddie Brown of the San Diego Union Tribune, modern fantasy football can be traced back to Wilfred Bill Winkenbach, an Oakland, California businessman and limited partner with uh, the then Oakland Raiders in a New York City Milford Plaza hotel room during a 1962 Raiders cross-country trip. Winkenbach, along with Raiders PR employee Bill Tunnell and Oakland Tribune reporter Scotty Sterling, developed the rules that would eventually be the basis of modern fantasy football. The next year, August of 63, the world's first league, the GOPPPL, Greater Oakland Professional Pigskin Prognosticators League, held its inaugural draft. Hall of Famer George Blander was the first ever selection. By 89, 26 years later, a million Americans were playing fantasy football. In 99, 10 years after that, Yahoo went against the grain and offered its first fantasy football product for free. By 2006, 12 million Americans were playing fantasy football. And by 2013, 21 million Americans were. Today, it's closer to 40, 40 million Americans. And it's a recent article by ESPN staff writer Josh Weinfuss. Yeah, so that's where it came from. When is he getting inducted in the Hall of Fame? 
He deserves it. Josh? The inventor. The inventor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the staff writer from ESPN. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, true. True. Should have a spot. Yeah. Did Sorry, you Susie, say it was 40 million? It's, yeah, it's over 40 oh, million. Okay. A few years ago, it was closer to like 50, 60 million, oh, wow. but it's come down quite sharply in the last couple of years. Probably they're reason. all watching uh, Bachelor. <laughs> no, that's not. That's 100% probably. They're probably all playing yeah, fantasy true. baseball, which is the superior fantasy sport. Oh, oh, boy. Complete not waste of time. Uh, a few fantasy football facts for you real quick. On average, players pay about 50 bucks to join a league, hoping to take home a first prize payout of 350 uh, according to Op Loans, uh, an Op Loans study. And the average amount of time spent by workers researching fantasy football whilst working is two hours a week according to fortune that's too long okay that is a long time to be researching uh one set of games per week they value their money over their time right <laughs> <laughs> maybe if you're playing fantasy baseball that makes sense that's too much time for football okay get together people uh that's all we've got time for for this week's episode thank you so much to my guests thank you to Susie. thank you thank you to blake thanks for having me thank you to oscar this week's winner of the game of the week thanks so much marcus and thank you to Victoria. She edits the show. Thank you to everyone listening. To ask questions or say hi, you can email us at podcast.emarketer.com. Uh, also, this coming Monday, the 25th, we have Industry Voices Spotlight on Financial Services with Visa and also a Tech Talk webinar with Products Up talking about orders from chaos controlling commerce anarchy. To sign up to those, you can click the link in the show notes. Uh, we'll see you guys hopefully on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily, the Marketer podcast made possible by Newstar. Happy weekends.